Aren't you glad that you live in the United States of America? You know, with all of our problems, with all of the things that we struggle with and all the things that we see, we are so thankful that God has seen fit to place us in a nation where we can walk in freedom, to where we can come into a place like this on a Sunday morning and not worry that somebody's going to come in here and disrupt our worship. It's still America. It's still America. But we're in a fight. We're in a fight. We're in a fight for our freedom. Amen. We're reminded this morning that this freedom is something that has to be defended. We're reminded this morning that it doesn't just come plopped in our hands, and it's, it, it's something that will just always be there, and there's nothing that anybody has to do. We're reminded that the reason we are here, the reason that we are free, is because men and women have come before us, and they have shed their blood on the battlefield to keep us free as a nation. And again, I'll say it again, with all of our problems, we are the freest nation in the world, and I would rather live in no other nation than the United States of America. But here's the thing we need to understand, church. We need to understand, with this freedom comes responsibility. And it's uncanny how, how parallel our situation in America is with our, uh, with our walk with Christ and the responsibility. We've been given freedom in both. But responsibility in both. We have a responsibility to not only defend our freedom, but to use it well. Amen? Amen? To use it well. It's a sad thing in America that people sometimes define freedom, meaning I can do whatever I want and forget everybody else. I can live a self-centered life. And, and yes, technically, our founding documents give people the right to live a life of indulgence, but that was never the highest ideal of the founders of this country. The highest ideal of freedom is that freedom would be used well. It would be used correctly. It would be used to uplift humanity, not to bring down humanity. And the same is true with our relationship with Christ. Christ has set us free from the guilt and the penalty of sin but not so that we can just sit and enjoy that, but so that we can be what He has called us to be. Amen? That is what freedom is. Freedom is married to responsibility. I'll tell you what, freedom is also married to sacrifice. And those are the things that Americans in the past, and I hope Americans in this room, understand that there is no freedom unless there's coupled with it sacrifice and responsibility. You know, when I was a kid and I was 14 and 15 years old, I couldn't wait to drive. I remember that time vividly. Do you all remember that time? It was like driving was like your biggest goal in life. And it was like you just couldn't wait till the day you could go down and take your driver's test and then come home, ask for the keys. Now, when my dad handed the keys over to me, he didn't say, here's the keys, son, go tear it up. He didn't say that. <laughs> what he said to me is, he said, I hope you know what will happen to you if you wreck my car. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and so he, in his gentle, subtle way, he conveyed to me that the freedom I had now to put that keys in the ignition and drive on down the road had a real responsibility that was attached to it. And he was going to enforce that in my life. And there again, our responsibility of the freedom that we've been given here in America and our responsibility, the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, it comes with sacrifice and it comes with responsibility. Jesus said this. He says, as you go, preach the message the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, 
drive out demons. And listen to what he said. Freely you have received. Freely give. Freely you have received. Freely give. He also said this. He said, For unto whosoever much is given, of him much will be required. And Paul teaches us this in Galatians chapter 5. It says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. So again, what we have been given, both in this nation and in Christ, comes with a responsibility. In Jesus, we we have a responsibility to order our life in a way that we live well. And we live in a way that reflects well upon God, upon heaven. To use what we have been given for good. Remembering that it all came by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Remembering that the Bible says that you and I, if we're followers of Christ, we have been bought with a price. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price, and listen to what the result of that is. You were bought with a price, therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God with what you do with this body. The expectations of Jesus and the Bible, again, are similar to the expectations of the founding fathers of the United States of America. That our freedom from sin and its penalty is based upon the blood of Christ. And our national freedom is based upon the blood of soldiers that have spilled that blood on battlefields. And both of those bloods, they come with a responsibility. That blood has a claim on our behavior. It's not only that that blood has granted us freedom, but it has a claim on our behavior. Both call us to exercise that freedom in a spirit of sacrifice and not selfishness. American freedom, as I said, by some has been defined as I can do whatever makes me happy. And it is true in our founding documents, you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I'll say it again, our founders hoped that the people of this nation would live to the highest ideal of what freedom means. That we would use that freedom to lift up and to go higher. To live a life of sacrifice, to live a life of responsibility, to use that freedom well. And Jesus says, now that we have been made free, you remember what the Word of God says? Now that you've been made free, take up your cross, Jesus says, and follow me. Exercise your freedom through your own personal sacrifice. Again, the founders, when our founders signed the Declaration of Independence, they pledged themselves to each other unto death. They knew that putting their name on that document would make them a target. And they were a target. Some of them were captured and tortured to death. Many of them lost their homes. Some of them even had their sons die in battle. Some of them themselves, they died in battle. But they all left us an example to follow. An example of sacrifice. An example of responsibility. And then we come to a chapter in our nation that we look back and we shake our heads because we remember the Civil War. We remember the Civil War when, when brothers fought against brothers, North fought against South, and our nation threatened to be torn apart. Abraham Lincoln had been elected, and the South was worried that he would begin to do away with slavery. The southern states, one by one, they sought to break away from the Union into the Confederate States of America. But Abraham Lincoln said, no, this can't be. We cannot split up the Union. We've got to stay united, the United States of America. And war began to keep the Union together. 
For four years, the North and the South, they fought each other. In, 19, or in 1861, a woman by the name of Julia Ward Howe wrote these words, and I think you're very familiar with them. Here's what she wrote. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of His terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. The battle hymn of the Republic. In one of those verses, there, she captures the essence of, of freedom and responsibility married and coupled together. Here's what she writes. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in His bosom that transfigures you and me. And listen to what she says now. He died to make men holy. Let us die to make men free while God is marching on. She uses the example of Christ's sacrifice to call Union soldiers to sacrifice in battle for, so that slaves could be set free. And over 360,000 men died to keep the Union together and to set the black man free. And just as Julia Ward Howe used the sacrifice of Christ as an example for Union soldiers back in the 1800s to follow, Today, we too have the example of the Founding Fathers and Christ. An example of sacrifice. We have an example of those that signed their name on those documents to set this nation in motion. And we have the example of our Savior who allowed Himself to be hung on a cross, shed His blood, and all the sins of the world placed upon Him as He took punishment there. All of those that come before us serve before us as an incredible example of the essence of freedom being coupled with sacrifice and responsibility. That each one of us that sit here today in the freedom of this country have placed upon us an incredible responsibility to live our lives right to defend the freedoms we have, to walk in the freedoms we have, and to live a life of sacrifice and responsibility. But unfortunately, most Americans live like the battle is over. In church, the battle is not over. Can you say amen? amen. It's not over. We have a responsibility. Long ago, we were, we were given this freedom. Freedom was won for us, and it was placed into our hands. It was hand, handed to us with the understanding that we now had a responsibility to defend it. Thomas Paine said this, He that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression. For if he violates this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach to himself. In other words, if you don't protect even your enemy's freedom, guess what? That's coming for you next. We have a responsibility. Thomas Jefferson said this, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Interesting words. Even the Declaration of Independence states this, that when a government turns into tyranny, it is the duty and the responsibility of the people to throw that government off. Now, don't get nervous. I'm not calling for revolution this morning. I'm just saying that if there would ever come a time in our life, in our history, where tyranny is upon us, it would be the responsibility of each one of us to stand up and defend that even unto death. Can you say amen? amen? And so until that time, we have the responsibility to use the tools that we have given, we've been given. We have the responsibility to speak up about what is happening in our country. We have the responsibility to speak up about what our children are being taught in schools. We have a responsibility to speak up and use the rights that we've been given in the founding of this country, to speak up about what politicians are doing and how they're steering this country into socialism. We have a responsibility. 
not just a right, but a responsibility to speak up about these things. We have a responsibility to defend all the freedoms that our Constitution gives us. And we have a responsibility to speak up to defend the unborn. They have a right to life. We must, willing, we must be willing, as they said earlier, even to fight if it becomes necessary. We must be willing to defend what we have been given. The ones that do not. The ones that think. The generation that ra rises up and thinks that they do not have to worry about these things. The generation that rises up and says, I will spend my freedom on myself and myself only will be the generation that loses freedom in this nation. Not only does our American freedom come with responsibility, but also, as I said earlier, our freedom in Christ comes with responsibility. And just as there can be Americans who are self-centered, only thinking their freedom is about them, the same thing is true in the church. There can be Christians who think that my salvation only concerns me. It's only about me. It's only about the fact that I'm going to heaven. It's only about the fact that God wants to meet my needs. It's only about the fact that my sin has been forgiven. But that is not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches, as we read earlier, that those that have been given great things have great responsibility with those things. We need to understand that just as the founders did not call people to self-indulgence, Christ on the cross is not calling us to just turn inward into self-indulgence, but calling us again to a life of sacrifice, a life of responsibility. Let's again look at what Jesus said. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. A responsibility we have from Christ that the things that we have been given, the things that we have been imparted with, the Holy Spirit living and moving on the inside of us, those privileges that we have because we have bowed our knee before Jesus Christ, those things given to us, those great blessings and gifts, we have a responsibility to not selfishly keep them for ourselves, but to let them flow through us, as we talked about last week. We have a responsibility to let God move through us, to not only set us free, but to set those who are around us free as well. Mark 16 says this, And these signs will accompany those that believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, don't get nervous, and when they drink deadly poison, don't get nervous, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Now, sometimes there is a case made that these words of responsibility are only given to the apostles. And so therefore, all that is done. But we need to remember that Jesus gave similar commands to the 72 that he sent out as well in Luke chapter number 10. He also told them in Matthew 28, he says this, and you'll remember this, the Great Commission, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20 says this, And teaching them to obey Everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so this is not only, I believe, this is not only how we should live, how we should conduct our lives, but don't you think also this mandate to make disciples and to teach them would also include the working of the Holy Spirit through the life of the disciples that the apostles make? I think so. There's no reason to believe that God said somewhere along the line, 
I started out giving my people tremendous power and gifts to be able to minister to people and help people and set people free. There's no reason to believe that somewhere along the way, God said, you know, I decided I don't want to do that anymore. I decided that I don't want you guys to set anybody free anymore. I just want you guys to come in and worship and listen to a sermon and go out and just be excited about going to heaven. But I do not want you to set people free anymore. You see, I can't find that anywhere that God said that. And so I believe that a part of our Christian responsibility is to seek and to gain and to attain an understanding about what is it that God wants of me. How does God want to use me? How does God want to use the power that he has placed within me? How does he want to use the gifts that he has placed within me? Because he wants me not to live just enjoying my salvation, but he wants me to live a life of sacrifice. He wants me to live a life of responsibility so that the power of God, the life of God, as we said last week, can flow in and as well flow out and meet the needs of the people that are around me. I believe that we have a responsibility to understand these things because they are in the Word of God. And we can't believe this part and not believe that part. We can't ignore the parts that we don't understand or that make us feel uncomfortable. Instead, we have to say, God, help me to understand this. Help me to know what you mean by these things. And so when we go to 1 Corinthians and we read about the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last week, we understand that God wants to give gifts in His church. We understand that He wants to empower every single one of you in this room that follow Jesus Christ. He wants the Holy Spirit to come and fill you, and He wants to give you gifts, and He wants to plant you in the family of God, and He wants to do incredible things through you. Not so that you can pat yourself on the back and say, aren't I a Christian star? But instead, so you can say, God, I, I love people. I love these people that are around me. I have this incredible compassion that's in my heart, and so often I'm at a loss because I don't know what to do. I can, my money isn't going to help. I can go do something, but that's not really going to help the problem they have. So, God, I don't know what to do. And the answer is in the Word of God. When we come to the end of what I can do with my physical flesh and blood hands, God says that the Holy Spirit can gift us and empower us and flow through us to do more than we could ever think. And so we have a responsibility to not shut off that flow. We have a responsibility to say, God, how do you want to use me to help and minister to the people that are around me? In Corinthians, it says this, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of these in all men and women. Everybody say amen. Amen. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. And all these are the work of the one and the same Holy Spirit. And He gives them to each one just as He determines. And you say say to yourself, Rich, how did we get from Memorial Day and honoring those that have died on the battlefield to talking about the gifts in the Holy Spirit? The reason we have and the, 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 and the why is this. That just as those soldiers were equipped to go out on the battlefield and do battle, God equips each one of you as soldiers to go out and do battle and to set people free. And the way that He does it is through the living 
power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that He grants. He equips us to do the work of the church. And the work of the church is to make a difference in the lives of the people that are around us. The lives of the people that sit around us in worship. The lives of the people that live in our little communities. He equips us so that we can actually do something about the things that we can do nothing about. Everybody say amen. 1 Corinthians 13 shows us a very important principle, though. It shows us this, because a lot of churches have gotten into trouble. They've gotten into a, a place where the gifts of the Holy Spirit have become the entire focus, and they become very man-centered. They become very fleshly. They have operated out of pride, and we've all seen that ugliness. But that doesn't mean we just throw it all out. I've seen it too. But Paul says this, he shows us the foundation in which these gifts flow and operate through us. And the foundation in which the gifts flow is simply through love, through compassion. Not wanting to be special in the church, but instead to look at a person's life and say, my heart grieves for them. I have a compassion on the inside of them. There is a love rising up on the inside of me, and I don't know what I can do with these hands, but God has the ability to meet their need that I can't, need, I can't meet. And that is what we're talking about here. And Paul says, if you will understand that the foundation of all this stuff, foundation of the power of God, is the love of God, the compassion of God, then it comes through in a way that is beautiful and not ugly. Paul writes like this. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you're just irritating. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but, ha but not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and Surrender all my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And so Paul writes that the foundation of all this is love. It's the giving of what I have received freely to those that are around me. Out of a motivation of love and compassion a strong desire to see. I see hurting people and I have a strong desire to want their needs to be met. I can't meet them in my physical ability, but God can meet them in His power. Paul sums it up like this. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. So church, Jesus has given us freedom from the penalty of our sin. He's given us freedom from the guilt of our sin that we no longer have to walk around with that on our back. And Jesus has given us freedom from the things that we have once been bound by. I'm sure that we can go around, there's a lot of stories about the way that we've lived our life before we came to Christ. And then Jesus set us free, amen? He set us free to live free of those things that once had us bound. And Jesus has made it possible by His shed blood on the cross that the Holy Spirit can now come and live within the believer. And the Holy Spirit then can also bring gifts. Gifts are available to function through us, meeting the needs of the people that are around us. We can choose to live out our lives, just as I said in the beginning. Americans can choose to live out their life in a selfish way. Christians can choose to live out their life in a selfish way. Or we can say, how is it that my freedom can benefit everybody else around me? How is it that God can flow through me and what He has given me can flow out and help those that are hurting around me. We can choose to enjoy 
alone, selfishly what God has given us, or we can choose to give and let flow through us what God has given us. We can give the message of the gospel that all sin can be forgiven. No matter what you've done, sin can be forgiven. You can be free. You can walk with, with no weight of sin on your back anymore. You can have complete freedom. We can preach that message and see people come to freedom in Jesus Christ. For people to find that freedom, for people to find peace with God, for people to find hope for the future. And we also can be a people that seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we allow God to flow through us and do the things that we can't do in our own physical ability. And we can know what part God wants us to play at Christ Community Church in being this conduit of love and compassion that will reach out and meet the needs of the people around us. Every single one of us in this room, we have this opportunity. God is holding this opportunity out to us. He's saying, if you want to be in this battle, if you want to live a life of significance, if you're tired of seeing the people around you hurt, and you want the supernatural power of God to flow through you, God says it is being held out to you. All you have to do is say, I want that, God. I want you to work through me. I want to see people's needs met. Why in the world wouldn't we as a people want God to move through us to meet the needs of the people that are around us? I believe our freedom in Christ, as I've been saying, comes